Thank you all for coming. I'm Guy Caruso with the energy program here at uh, CSIS. So we really welcome you and uh, to this great opportunity to hear about the IEA's latest uh, energy technology analysis. And uh, as uh, many of you know, you know, technology has been critical to energy over the last at least 40 years that, that we've been analyzing it uh, here at the, with the Department of Energy in my previous job and now here at CSIS. But for those of us who've been trying to fit, forecast supply and demand over these last years, if someone said, what, what was the thing you, you missed the most? And that was the pace of technology change. So when the IEA was formed in 1974, in addition to the response to the uh, Arab oil embargo and the emergency preparedness functions, which is the core of IEA, there was also the coordination of policy as a, an important part of IEA. But the third leg of IEA's uh, remit back then was a strong energy technology program. And it's one that I don't think gets enough attention. It's been very uh, instrumental in, uh, in the IEA success, I think, over the last uh, 40 years of its existence, uh, partly because of the collaboration on energy technology projects within the IEA member countries, but maybe equally as important, the uh, opportunity for collaboration and coordination with uh, non-member countries such as China and uh, South Africa, uh, Russia for a number of key uh, countries. So the IEA technology program is quite important and I think uh, the IEA is uh, extremely fortunate to uh, have leading that program as its uh, current Deputy Director for Sustainable Energy Policy and Technology, uh, Didier Hussein, who will present the IEA energy technology perspectives uh, report uh, to us in, in a few moments. Didier is uh, well experienced in the energy field, both as a industry, private sector uh, experience, as well as with the Ministry of Industry and the French government. And then uh, coming to the IEA first as deputy uh, director for uh, emergency preparedness and energy markets. And what's it been, about two years that you moved to technology? About two years ago, uh, uh, DDA moved to the energy technology job. So we're going to hear from uh, one of the most experienced people in the IEA, one of the most uh, you know, insightful, and, uh, and it's been great to have to call uh, Didier a, a colleague and a friend over a number of years. So uh, we look forward to hearing uh, uh, the uh, summary of the energy technology perspectives, which is a report that uh, IEA has been uh, issuing every other year for a, a number of years now. And it really, uh, I think the unique part of it is that it, it goes out far enough, 2050, that you can really make some uh, important take some very important takeaways as you look out in the, some of these critical issues, including uh, sustainable energy and, uh, and the uh, various aspects of energy efficiency, for example, that, uh, that Didier has been working on. So Didier, thank you very much for coming in. We uh, appreciate very much your taking the time to come visit us. Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you very much, Guy, for this uh, very nice introduction. Uh, I think you very well set the scene in terms of why the IEA has been since its uh, formation doing some work on uh, technology, because uh, we've always thought, and I think it's uh, more true than ever, that technology has a very important role to play to meet our goals uh, in terms of uh, sustainability, uh, uh, climate change mitigation, energy security, energy access. And, uh, I, uh, and we think that today it's, uh, uh, the importance of technology is, 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 is more and more uh, uh, recognized. Uh, what I want to do 
this morning is, is briefly present you uh, uh, energy technology perspective 2014, ETP 2014, that was uh, released uh, on the 12th of May by uh, the IEA Executive Director in the Clean Energy Ministerial Meeting in Seoul. Um, the uh, ETP uh, objective is to present is to present a comprehensive and long-term view of energy trends and uh, technology. Um, maintaining a long-term view, looking into the evolution, the possible evolution into 2050, is, is quite challenging when you think about all the uh, 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 developments that have taken plan place uh, over the last year. If you think about the uh, shale gas boom in Northern America. Uh, the uh, extensive cost reduction in many renewable technologies or the uncertainty surrounding the future of nuclear power. But uh, ETP uh, emphasizes the need to maintain this long-term vision when it comes to energy policy and to, to um, manage the energy tran transition which is needed, needed in a holistic way rather than just responding to uh, short-term developments of the energy system. So the message is uh, twofold. Uh, first, a radical change of course is long overdue as we clearly were not on track on a uh, climate-friendly trajectory. Uh, and secondly, at the same time, there is a positive message is that we try to show that it is doable, that it is uh, cost-effective, um, uh, even if it's very ambitious. And, and, and the key point is that technology will have a key role to play in this energy uh, transition uh, that we need. Um, last point is about the new format of ETP. Um, you can find three things in the book. First, uh, the, what we call the global outlook, which is the update of our long-term scenarios. Um, secondly, uh, um, report about tracking clean energy progress, and you have copies of this report in the, in the hall. Uh, it can also be downloaded uh, from uh, our website. And thirdly, the larger part of the book is about one specific subject, and this year we've picked up the role of electricity, how to harness the potential of electricity in the energy transition. So you have uh, the tracking report in the whole, as well as an executive summary that gives you a, a brief summary of the, of the whole book. Let me start with the global outlook. Uh, the starting point uh, is uh, what we call uh, uh, the um, carbon intensity index of energy supply. And what is striking uh, in this chart is to show that this, uh, despite extensive investment in low carbon uh, energy, the, um, the carbon intensity of global energy supply has stayed the same in a long period of time, resulting in uh, increasingly high emission as energy demand was growing. Indeed, even if en em emerging economies have stepped up their ambitions in terms of uh, clean energy and became leaders in, in many of them, the ongoing increase in coal use in many emerging economies has more than offset these efforts. Uh, for instance, over the last 10 years, the increase in coal fire uh, power generation has been uh, as important as uh, the combination of all low carbon technology uh, capacity increases. It underlines the need to improve coal plant efficiency on one side and also to scale up efforts to promote carbon capture and storage. So ETP shows that a change in direction is, is, is needed uh, by looking into three scenarios. Uh, the 60S, which is the continuation of current trends. The 40S, that takes into consideration recent pledges that have been made by governments to limit emissions and to step up efforts to improve energy efficiency. And that's kind of the central scenario. And finally, the 2D scenario, 2 degree scenarios, was, uh, uh, which is the main focus, of course, of ETP. And it, des it describes a scenario which uh, would be consistent with limiting the increase in global temperatures to 2 degrees. Uh, this um, chart shows the difference uh, between uh, how we can meet a 2D scenario compared to the uh, business as usual trend. And, uh, it shows that uh, glo it's possible to uh, decouple uh, global population and economic growth uh, from energy demand, even for oil. And although this, uh, this scenario has a clearly a climate objective, it has profound 
benefits for energy security and for the global economy. And the convergence of these different topics is more and more clear, uh, including for emerging economies. And I would say that today, with uh, current developments in the Middle East, the concern about future oil prices and energy security become more and more important, but they, uh, they are also a, a strong driver from our perspective to move faster in the energy transition. How we can meet that gap between the 60S and the 2DS, the first uh, thing is energy efficiency. Uh, it's a confirmation of previous IEA work. Uh, energy efficiency has always been uh, overlooked and underestimated. We think that looking at the most cost-effective solutions, it, it would represent almost 40% of the global abatements uh, compared to uh, the 60S. But this is not enough. We need also a change in the, uh, on the supply side. And the role of renewable is dominant on the supply side with 30% of the difference between the two scenarios followed by a CCS at 14%, nuclear 7%. What is, is important is to see that compared to our previous modeling exercise, the role of renewable has been increased, reflecting current trends on energy markets, whereby the role of CCS and nuclear has declined. But I'll come back to that. So this is a ma ma massive change in course which is needed, and the efforts in terms of, in of investment are huge. Uh, but we uh, do think that it would be cost effective in the long run. The difference between the two scenarios in terms of needed investment amounts to 44 trillion US dollars, but the, these efforts would be compensated uh, by uh, over 115 trillion US dollar uh, savings uh, in terms of fuels. And as you can see on this chart, even with a 10% discount rate, uh, this would pay off in the long run. But of course, one of the key challenges in this transition is how to finance uh, uh, investment in low carbon energy, uh, which have uh, increased upfront costs, and which makes also financing much more uh, difficult. And this is why we have in the book a specific analysis about how to finance uh, um, low carbon uh, energy investment, and I'll come back to that later. This let me move now to the Tracking Clean Energy Progress Report. Just one slide trying to summarize the result of this, uh, of this chapter. This chapter looks at recent developments for uh, a number of clean technologies, which, are, uh, which of them are progressing, are on track, on a 2DS trajectory, which are not. Uh, the picture is rather gloomy. Of course, it's a confirmation, because we all know that the 2DS is very ambitious. Uh, but still, there is one exception. Renewables uh, are green on this chart. Why? Because they have even beaten expectations and previous forecasts in terms of uh, global deployment, <coughs> and they are on track with the 2DS trajectory. Uh, we also had before electric vehicles. Electric vehicles still are progressing at fast rate, but, fast but not fast enough to be uh, in line with the 2DS trajectory. And uh, for other uh, technologies that are in yellow, the picture is a bit mixed, and, and some of them are really not on track, in particular CCS. This is uh, one of the key issues if you think about the very important role of fossil fuels in the mix, uh, in particular for many em uh, emerging countries. And I think this is one of the key challenges in this uh, energy transition. As you can see in this list, a number of these technologies are linked to electricity, and we do think that electricity is going to play a defining role uh, in this uh, first uh, half of the century as the energy career that will increasingly uh, power economic growth and development. This is why we have decided to focus on electricity in this uh, ETP uh, with the key messages that it's important also to uh, get it right and to decarbonize the electricity sector. And a number of options are available with renewables, nuclear power, CCS smart grids, to, just to name a few. Uh, but again, the challenge is, ima is great, and, 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 and a number of uh, policies will need to be put in place to decarbonize electricity generation, and doing so, cleaning up the end use sectors by switching to electricity. Uh, this is uh, moving to electricity. This is the, uh, the summary of the uh, uh, key developments that we see in the three scenarios of ETP. Uh, what is striking is that in all of them, you see an increasing role uh, for electricity in, in, in final energy demand. It's growing in all scenarios. 
uh, at different uh, paces because uh, the growth is 80% uh, for the 2DS and 130% for the uh, 60S. Uh, of course, it's lower for the 2DS because, as I said, energy efficiency is key. Uh, and, uh, and it's important across the board, including in the energy, uh, in the electricity sector, in the 2DS. But it doesn't mean that electricity is less important for the 2DS. Uh, on the contrary, uh, the uh, share of um, electricity in overall energy demand grow would grow in the uh, 2DS from 17% to 26%. And uh, uh, furthermore, uh, there would be a key difference in the 2DS. Electricity would overtake all products as the largest energy carrier in the energy system. But the growth in electricity use is not necessarily a positive development. It uh, also depends on the way uh, electricity is generated. And uh, today, as uh, you can see um, the, uh, here, the um, power represents 40% of primary energy demand and produces 40% of global carbon uh, emissions. So in the 2DS, there is a radical change uh, of this situation. Uh, with, um, in the 2DS, the growth in overall energy demand is moderated, and the increase uh, in the use of electricity means that the power sectors would consume more than half of primary energy uh, but at the same time contributes only 5% of global emissions as uh, almost all the power generation sector is decarbonized. So how would uh, electricity be generated in the 2DS? There you have a total uh, change uh, uh, in, in, in course, a reversal from how electricity is generated today. Today is more than uh, two-thirds based on uh, fossil fuels, uh, with 20% coming from renewables, and in the 2DS at this global level, and the situation is different among regions, of course, but you have uh, uh, two-thirds coming from renewables, not just variable renewables, also including lots of biomass and hydro, uh, but still two-thirds from renewables. What would be the share of variable renewables? It would be 30% in our model at global level, again, with key differences among regions. Uh, we come back to that, which means that with such a high share of, of variable renewables in the power system, you need to change the way your uh, power system is managed and increase its uh, capacity to adapt to uh, uh, flexibility uh, and to the variability of uh, power generation. Let me move now to the regional situation because, of course, the global averages are a bit misleading. The situation uh, is very different uh, according to different regions. Um, and we see uh, very different pathways of electricity system developments uh, in different regions. For the OECD, we've seen over the last year a very flat uh, demand, uh, very modest growth in electricity demand in the OECD uh, regions. And we expect this trend to continue in the 2DS with a growth limited to 16% by 2050. Um, it means that the challenges for OECD countries would be rather to maintain a high level of reliability of electricity supply against the backdrop of uh, limited growth in revenues and aging infrastructure. In emerging economies and developing countries, you have a very uh, significant growth, averaging 150% uh, at a global level, um, which means a, a, a key challenge of managing large investment needs to meet the growth in demand for electricity, and uh, including large investment needed in electricity infrastructure. If you look at India, you know, the growth in electricity is even higher. It's 300% uh, by 2050. Uh, with, and and, and we, looked, we looked into the situation of India more specifically this year with a specific chapter on, on India, uh, reflecting the uh, key challenges of the uh, uh, power sector in India. First, to provide access to electricity to 300 million Indians that do not have access to uh, modern energy today, and at the same time uh, power, uh, powering the projected economic growth of, of the country, and in addition, the very high level of uh, uh, carbon, uh, coal-based electricity generation, representing more than two-thirds of the, of the uh, electricity production in China, means that decarbonizing or starting to decarbonize the power, power sector in India will be extremely challenging. 
I don't go further into details, but we have a specific study on India in the book. Let's look now at the situation of, uh, in Northern America, more specifically. Uh, it, it's, uh, what is striking is, uh, 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 like in OECD countries, the uh, growth in global actress to demand is low, much lower than the global averages. Uh, and at the same time, uh, we have a, a shift to low carbon and generation. Um, but in the near term, we see that the impact of, shale, of the shale gas revolutions means that shale, uh, natural gas uh, the role of natural gas will be uh, increasing, uh, at least in the short to medium term. And uh, better in, in the longer term, we see also a shift away from fossil fuel electricity generation, uh, uh, which is even larger than for the global averages. Uh, with a large chunk of variable uh, 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 renewable energy in the mix, uh, we will need to increase the flexibility of electricity systems and a variety of options are available. Um, as you can see here, uh, the uh, most important one today is dispatchable uh, generation, uh, but also uh, grid infrastructure development, including uh, smart grids, uh, demand, demand side integration and, and storage. We've looked more specifically uh, this year in ETP at two of these options. Uh, first, um, the role of uh, natural gas, because uh, natural gas uh, has, 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 is genera gas fire generation is supporting two key elements in, the, in a cleaner energy system. First, increasing integration of renewables as a, as a dispatchable, uh, flexible uh, generation uh, capacity and also displacing coal fire generation, as we've seen in Northern America with the development of, of shale gas. And this has, uh, uh, this has uh, uh, sparked significant uh, C, um, uh, decrease in CO2 emissions, in particular in the US. But it means that there will be some challenges in terms of the role of, of gas in these two uh, situation. Um, with the, and, and for the countries which have a, a large part of variable renewable energy, the flexibility of gas-fired gas uh, power generation will be uh, extremely important to uh, um, serve as a, as a backup uh, in the power system. The second uh, area of flexibility where, which we have uh, analyzed more in depth is the role of storage. There is a lot of hype and expectation about the role of electricity storage. And uh, of course, lots of uh, people think that if we had a significant breakthrough in, in terms of electricity storage, then we would be able to uh, uh, open the door to unlimited deployment of variable renewable energy. Uh, so we've uh, done an in-depth analysis of the different uh, uh, options for storage and benchmarking them against other flexibility options. Uh, today, storage technologies co come in very different uh, uh, shapes and sizes, uh, from uh, a large pumped hydro system to battery inside some of our uh, uh, of, of the many appliances that we use on a daily basis, including also some of the thermal energy storage options. So we have a variety of options and applications that are different in size. Uh, uh, but uh, for the moment, we must recognize that electricity storage is pretty limited to a pumped uh, hydro system in the electricity uh, system, and its contributions remain limited to due to higher costs and insufficient performances. So near-term opportunities need to be further exploited, including uh, frequency regulation, um, uh, or off-grid applications uh, that are quite prom promising, off-grid application uh, connected with, uh, for instance, uh, PV solutions for isolated areas. Uh, that are, uh, so there are a number of uh, attractive niche opportunities, but we don't think that today we can uh, um, expect storage to become a silver bullet for the problem of flexibility of power systems, considering the need to lower the cost extensively for many applications. I mentioned the role of, uh, of, of gas, and, and, and the gas will uh, serve as a, as, a, as a bridge in the uh, energy uh, transition. 
And in all our scenarios, we see the role of gas increasing uh, by 2025 uh, uh, um, um, through fuel switching from, from coal to gas and, and the development of gas in many regions. But after 2025, uh, the carbon content of gas is too high compared to the objective of the 2DS to be maintained without CCS. So we see a decline of the role of, uh, of gas uh, for the later part of the uh, period, and, and gas need to be um, used as a baseload option just with uh, CCS. And this is why we have undertook, uh, undertaken a comparison of the cost and benefits of applying CCS to coal and to gas fire generation. Usually CCS is uh, analyzed in the context of coal fire generation. And uh, it's true that the cost per, uh, per ton of uh, CO2 is higher for gas than for coal. But if we compare the cost of low emissions electricity production, uh, gas is more attractive than coal fire generation, uh, including with CCS. Uh, with a carbon price of around $100 per ton, um, combined cycle gas turbines with CCS have a lower levelized cost of electricity than uh, CCGTs alone, which reflects the importance of the carbon price, and it's also less costly than uh, clean coal uh, options with CCS. Uh, let me now move to the, to the uh, demand side uh, of the uh, equation, which is also critical in the uh, energy transition. And what we show through this slide is that through decarbonizing electricity production, we, uh, we can decarbonize mo most of the end use sectors. Um, and it's particularly striking for the building sector, which represents um, uh, uh, half of electricity, uh, of global electricity use, if you, in, uh, if you include also the appliances. <coughs> and so it, the carbon impact of buildings is even higher than transport if you include the carbon content of power generation. So through decarbonizing uh, power generation, we have a spillover effect in all end use sector. It's also true for the uh, transport sectors, even if uh, the role of electricity is much more limited. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, although electricity makes up only around 10% of total transport energy demand by 2050, even in the 2DS, so a limited role for electricity, it accounts for approximately half of transport efficiency gain. And, but it, it doesn't mean that the electrification of transport can offer emission reduction in all situations. And we've looked at uh, different options, different transport modes for which uh, electrification would make sense in a specific chapter on e-mobility. And in this chapter, we have developed a tool that we call the Low Carbon Electric Transport Maximization Index. And with this uh, uh, tool, uh, we uh, try to uh, offer analysis uh, as to what situations can offer the maximum benefit to electrifying transport based on individual country situations. I mentioned the building sector. It's a very important part of the, uh, uh, um, um, of, of where, where, where the uh, uh, electrification can play an important role. And we've looked at a variant, a what-if scenario, if we go uh, even farther than in the 2DS in terms of developing the role of electricity through modern heat pumps uh, for heating and cooling of space and, and, and water, uh, even further than in the 2DS. And what, what it shows is that uh, having a wider use of these uh, heat pumps uh, could have benefits in terms of uh, extensive benefits uh, in terms of displacing also the use of natural gas. And we've studied this particular uh, variant scenario for two regions, uh, the EU and, uh, and China. In both cases, we see a much lower role in this variant for natural gas, which has uh, important benefits for the EU. If you think at the problem of gas supply, the, the cost and the energy uh, security concerns in Europe about future gas supply. Uh, in this case, the uh, role of the share of, of gas in the EU uh, comes down compare, uh, from, from 34 today to 25% uh, in the 2DS scenario. In the case of China, you have a very, very sharp increase in the role of gas, but it, which is lower than in the 2DS scenario if you develop, of course, uh, much more modern heat pumps for uh, heating, cooling of space and, and water. 
Let me move now to uh, uh, another area that we've studied in, in the book. Uh, it's uh, the important uh, uh, energy implications of more and more uh, devices going uh, online. As internet access and usage spreads at a rapid rate, the electricity demand of network-enabled device, devices is expected to almost double uh, by 2025, so it's an extremely rapid increase of these, uh, of these devices. And uh, as they spend most of their time in a standby mode, up to 80% of the electricity consumption is just to maintain connection to the, to the network. This is just an example here with uh, gaming and consoles, uh, but it's true for many other uh, network-connected devices uh, for which we, there is a lot of uh, energy squandering uh, also linked to the importance of uh, staying in standby mode. And we have... Uh, estimated uh, that uh, these equipment, uh, the demand of electricity from this equipment could be slashed by two-thirds uh, just by implementing best available technologies. Uh, this uh, would result in savings of almost corresponding to 4% of total uh, final electricity consumption today. So it's a, it's a, it's a massive uh, stake which is uh, often uh, overlooked and uh, 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 an issue that we think should be studied at international level in the coming years. Financing, uh, I'm at the, I said at the beginning that the role of financing during the transition uh, to a low carbon electricity system will be very important. Uh, why? Because uh, low carbon generation is not only more expensive but uh, uh, than conventional generation like uh, CCGTs, as you can see on the chart, but the uh, it's also much more capital, in, in capital intensive. So this uh, uh, increased upfront capital cost uh, can increase the various risks that are perceived by investors, including construction risk, electricity price risk, carbon policy risk, and others. And in the absence of a carbon price and wholesale electricity prices may be inadequate to incentivize investment in low carbon power generation. And, and this lack of investment uh, is, 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 a, is a key risk in the, in the transition, and there is a very important reflection to be, uh, to be made at the political level as uh, how to uh, limit the risk for investors and put in place the appropriate market designs and appropriate market frameworks to encourage investment in low-carbon uh, technologies. One of the key uh, uh, ways to clear the obstacle uh, towards a 2DS uh, uh, trajectory uh, is to change the perspective about uh, uh, energy system and electricity system. Uh, the, the key message being that a sustainable electricity system will uh, be a, a smarter, more unified and, integra and integrated electricity system, uh, more decentralized and multi-directional uh, where technologies should be deployed together rather than in isolation, and policies would need to address electricity system as a whole rather than specific uh, technologies. And, and, and it's true that traditionally we tend to have too much of focus on the supply side rather than the demand side, as we, and we may well see a number of revolution on the demand side through the use of ICT, the rules of, uh, of smart grids, that could really change the nature of our electricity system. So success will hinge on system uh, thinking, uh, which is more uh, efficient because it identifies synergies across sectors and application, and it focuses on the efficiency of the service provided rather than the energy uh, delivered. So let me conclude with uh, just uh, the uh, summary, uh, summary of the outline of the book. I haven't mentioned all the, all, all the specific analysis that you can find in ETP 2014. In particular, we have a, a specific chapter on the role of solar energy, which has been the fast grow, fastest growing energy, renewable energy source over the last year and, and will play a key role in the 2DS. Um, I mentioned the double role, the double role of natural gas, uh, e-mobility, the role of storage, financing, and, and India. So a different uh, series of specific analysis, uh, more detail uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the importance of uh, electricity. 
let me now conclude with uh, a couple of key messages. First, uh, 2DS would represent a radical change in course, uh, but it's what we try to show through this scenario. It's not a forecast, it's just a scenario uh, based on least cost uh, options. Uh, and so we uh, try to show that it is uh, doable. Um, electricity will play a, a key role in that process and the, in the transition. So uh, the reflections at the political level on market design and how to favor investment in low carbon power generation options will be key. And finally, a strong leadership which uh, will be needed both in industry and among policymakers to embrace this long-term vision which is needed and put in place the necessary uh, financial means, uh, which, uh, uh, because mobilizing the necessary financing now uh, will uh, be uh, uh, much better than uh, having to pay a much higher price, a uh, much higher price down the road. Because one of the things we show is that the more you you wait, the more costly the transition will be. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention, and uh, I would like to introduce you also, David Elzinger, who will. Uh, uh, come to participate to the Q&A session now, is uh, the project manager for this project and uh, one of the, uh, our best electricity specialists. So please don't hesitate to ask him very, very technical and difficult questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Didier, and uh, thank you, David, for joining us. So, as you can imagine, somebody actually has to make sure that a project like this ETP every set other year gets shepherded through the system and published, and that's David's role. And I can tell you from the history of having worked with the late Lee Shipper and other of your predecessors, it's a, it's a tough job. So uh, you're lucky to have David uh, Didier, as you said. Um, you know, one thing that strikes me as you look at the, that presentation is it's a, the pathway to 2050 as in the, under the different scenarios uh, looks very, obviously it's very ambitious when you think about the, the uh, shifting out of coal, for example, in the electricity sector and places like China and India. And, um, what kind of... A, when you present this and, and, and work with the uh, large consumers who are not members of EIA in particular, how, how do they, what kind of response have you been getting on, in terms of the, the uh, really deployment of that technology? I mean, we've been talking about some of those things for a number of years, and obviously CCS and others and the things in the electricity sector. How, if, if, and and you, you point out how in recent years, we've actually seen a kind of, you call it stuck, we're kind of stuck with, uh, you know, the uh, energy intensity going kind of in the wrong way uh, with coal actually rising in, in uh, I think in the BP presentation we heard just a week ago, they're saying coal has actually been the fastest growing fuel in the last decade. So it's kind of, yeah, we seem to be going a bit in the wrong direction. How, how, what kind of response have you been getting from the, from these large emerging economies when you present your information or when they come to IEA meetings? Sir? Yeah, this, this, is a, this is a very good question, of course, and they, it's always a challenge to present it to the yes, because and, and, and in the book, again, we have two messages. It's doable, it's necessary. At the same time, we're really not on track when we look at current developments. At the same time, there are some seeds for uh, for hope, and uh, and 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 there is a, a, a broader realization of the first the importance of climate change to extreme uh, weather events that we are, are becoming more and more frequent. I think the uh, um, the realization in the public opinion and many governments that this is a real issue is 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 increasing. Also, there are other drivers in the energy transition, in particular for emerging economies that are maybe not so as concerned as in uh, some more industrialist countries about the challenges of uh, climate change, but are very concerned about the question of energy security, the problem of oil prices, and today I think that's uh, more uh, evident than ever. 
uh, how to develop their domestic resources uh, to increase their energy security and also to combat uh, pollution. I think for China is, is an obvious uh, um, key political objective now, and they've put in place a number of tools to limit the role of carbon, of course, starting from a very high level. But still, it's a change in trends, which uh, I think is quite interesting. And to give you an example, uh, uh, the, uh, these uh, reports was presented by the Clean Energy Ministerial and, 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 uh, um, uh, and China has been extremely active in the Clean Energy Ministerial process, uh, and, and China is extremely motivated uh, by developing, uh, by developing uh, uh, renewable technologies, and uh, it's not just for, it's not just for climate change; it's for equality, uh, it's just for energy security, and they're developing all options, including nuclear, uh, switching from coal to gas, develop, developing renewables, and China has become the first market for renewables. And I didn't mention it in the presentation, but if renewables are green, is is is, is despite the OECD countries, not because of the I, of the OECD countries, because there, we we saw a slowdown in uh, uh, um, for various reasons in in OECD countries in terms of investment for renewables in 2013. So it's a short term time period. Um, and 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 the most of the increase was was in emerging economies, and in particular in China. And, 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 and most of the, uh, more than half of the P, uh, PV panels were installed in, the, in Asia in 2013 and not, not, not in OECD countries. So these are just examples. Having said that, it's true that the challenge of, uh, considering the, the role of coal, uh, the challenge of uh, uh, moving away from coal as the, as the key source of power generation at global level remains uh, extremely, extremely uh, uh, difficult. Moving first to clean coal technologies rather than, than, than subcritical technologies that still represent almost two thirds of new investments, so will be there for 50 years, is, is, is one first thing. And continuing the efforts uh, to promote CCS. And we are concerned in the IEA by the lack of progress uh, in terms of CCS and uh, a more limited interest uh, among policymakers. And uh, we think that it's very important to continue to uh, um, do uh, R&D and try to cut the cost of uh, CCS because it, has, it will have a ro an important role to play um, in this energy transition. Do you want to add anything there? Just, just a small thing, um, just a, a surprise when we, we looked at the data. Um, so uh, the, the curve that um, Didier showed was the, the energy uh, sector carbon intensity index. We also do an electricity generation carbon intensity index. And uh, it shows a very similar trend on the global level, but then when you look at regions, you see some differences. And, you know, when you look at China, that's, uh, you know, the, the bad guy on the block often from an uh, emissions uh, perspective. Their, uh, their uh, electricity generation sector index has been coming down over a number of years. So they, they are actually making progress uh, in, this, in this area. With that said, their demand is growing very much as well, so their, their net emissions are growing, of course, um, but, but they are doing something. So I think it is uh, very important to uh, look at um, what, what actions can be taken in specific regions. And again, our analysis is framed in the, um, uh, in the lens of, of uh, CO2 emissions reductions. But it has uh, huge impacts on economy uh, and positive impacts on economy and energy security. So looking at it more holistically, uh, you can uh, create those drivers that, that really are relevant um, and can motivate uh, emerging economies as well. Well, let's open the uh, We've got plenty of time for questions. So uh, I'll open up the start with Scott and then uh, this gentleman to the left. Uh, Scott Augenbaugh, CSIS. Um, I have a question about uh, carbon capture. Have you thought about separating out carbon capture from CO2 conversion uh, going forward? Because one of the things that's been suggested is a series of ways in which we can just remove CO2 from certain resources. Things like the US Navy, for instance, in, uh, is focusing on how do you extract uh, CO2 from uh, ocean water. Uh, and other sorts of uh, technologies there. And then the other part of this would be, uh, if you're talking about electrifying a battery fleet, um, 
if a battery still costs you $5,000, as Elon Musk has as a target for his Tesla vehicle, you can't really sell that in the developing world. So uh, some of these technologies, obviously, I think there's some hope for them, but uh, how far away are we, in your opinion, from some of those two particular technologies really taking off, or the sets of technologies? I, I would, I would, thank you for the question. I would just like to make a, a general point, which I think is important to understand how ETP is, is done, and then David will respond to the question more directly. Uh, is, is that we don't include uh, in, in, in our modeling exercise technology breakthrough. This is why, uh, paradoxically, even if it's ambitious, it's, it's, it's very cautious in terms of which technology could be used. Uh, because you cannot predict the unpredictable, and you cannot predict uh, a technology breakthrough that may provide some solutions, like a dramatic breakthrough in terms of the cost of batteries. And, and, and when we look at storage, we, we start from existing technologies, trying to forecast some decline in cost based on, on, on reasonable assumptions, but we don't foresee a massive breakthrough in CCS, a massive breakthrough in, in, in the cost of batteries or other options. And uh, um, and one of the other messages is that it's important to uh, continue R&D in many uh, options that are not available today, but that may provide part of the solution uh, looking forward. Because if you look at the technology breakthrough that we've seen over the last year, whether it's on renewables, whether it's on shale gas, it's always been a combination of long-term R&D efforts, policy frameworks that incentivize the development of a technology, and market conditions that allow them to suddenly take off, which was the case for shale gas when, I mean, the efforts on horizontal drilling had been uh, had been supported by the U.S. government for many years, for instance, and suddenly when you have a, a spike in gas prices, you have, and, and the proper market fr uh, policy framework, you can see the technology ramp up. We may well see the same sort of thing with CCS because the technology is not totally unknown. It's just too costly and, and the, incent the uh, incentives to for deploying it are not there. Uh, this is why we need to maintain the message that, that the support to CCS should be there. Um, so this is a general point that the, all the scenario are based on existing technologies and, and, and we don't include potential breakthrough. But now I leave it to David for the difficult part. Well, so f firstly, on CO2 conversion, it's not included. So that's a, a very simple. <clears throat> but I, I will just add to that that we look at CO2 or CCS often in the context of uh, the power sector, but actually in the 2DS by 2050, we see 50% of that being deployed in industry as well. So it's just a small point I want to make that um, to decarbonize the industrial sector, um, CCS is a, an essential technology, and, and we really are not seeing the progress that we need. And we, we have done a scenario where we look at um, uh, meeting the two degrees scenario with a high renewable share with decreased nuclear and decreased CCS. And we indeed can make it, uh, it just costs more. So again, we, it really reinforces the importance of um, near-term R&D to uh, do the learning, um, but also start to develop the policy framework so we can really incentivize its use. Now on to, to storage. Um, so. A couple, a couple aspects with our analysis. We looked out to 2025 in our analysis on storage, not, um, or for, for uh, a good portion of it, and some of it we did out to 2050. But the reason we limited some of our analysis to 2025 is because it is truly rapidly changing. With that said, one of our key messages are, storage is a great technology, very important, but it's not necessarily a game changer or we don't need a game changer in order to integrate the variable renewables that we need in the energy system. We have other options, flexible generation, interconnection on the demand side. So from that perspective, uh, yes, it's important. We need to investigate it. It can be a really active tool in the transition to a sustainable energy system. But if it doesn't happen, we have many other tools in the toolbox. And then lastly on storage, one of the interesting aspects is looking at the interaction of, say, electric vehicles and using that battery within uh, the electric vehicle to support the integration of renewables. Therefore, a lot of the capital cost you, you see is for the function of transport. And then when you share that, that, that little piece of infrastructure to then um, provide whether backup power or uh, electricity system support 
um, so you share that, it brings the, the incremental cost significantly down. And in that perspective, more using the, the battery uh, from a, a demand side integration perspective, you can actually see some much more near-term application. So it's, it's that systems thinking in a very small way and then bringing it out to the systems thinking uh, more broadly. Hans, I mean, uh, did the, the uh, analogy with shale oil, or shale gas, or shale uh, technology is very interesting because, as you know, I mean, that's been a 40-year overnight success. I mean, the, Halliburton's been working on that since 1980, and finally it's now pretty successful, and as you point out, market conditions were important, but also there wasn't despite some government investment in R&D, it was largely the private sector and the tax system and the market conditions that really made it go. Whereas you think something like CCS and storage, really I think uh, you might follow that path, but I do think government policy probably play, a, seems to me, a far more important role in actually ultimately leading to you know, CCS and storage, I don't know, that's sort of a non-technologist perspective. Is that, you, you, you agree with that or you, you think that it, it, we can do it without? Uh yeah, yeah uh, to a certain extent, I think in CCS, the big difference is it doesn't produce any, uh, produce any, any energy, so the incentives, I mean, would be, if, if you have a clear perspective of a carbon price, I think that would that would drive the efforts of the of the of the private sector because uh, cheap coal with CCS could become a, a clean option if you bet on a on, on a future carbon price. Otherwise, there's no need to invest. But if you change that, I mean, uh, more and more governments are combating coal for various reasons, including including the, the air quality issue. And, and coal was diminished dramatically in, 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 in the EU in coming years, probably also in the US with recent decision of the uh, current administration. Uh, in many parts of the world, the resources are there. So the potential of having cheap coal uh, with cheaper CCS could become an interesting option. But uh, I think the question of the carbon price, I think for storage is a bit different because you see a lot of private stakeholders investing in storage uh, through different angles, batteries for car, car systems, uh, uh, electric vehicle system, because if, uh, look at the success of Tesla or others, there are, if some breakthrough could lead to quite success business model and, 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 and be, uh, that could be rewarded by, uh, by the market today. But again, the, you're perfectly right that the policy framework will be important. I think, yeah. Yes, sir. Please uh, state your name and I'm Bob Wright, uh, Department of Energy, Office of Fossil Energy, and I know you were focusing on electricity, um, but I, I'm, I'm sure, I assume, you probably read the forecast from BP and Exxon and Shell and EIA, okay? How does your scenario, what are the differences that you see in your scenarios versus uh, any one of those or all of them? One of the key things is that let's let's be very clear here that uh, these aren't forecasts. Uh, so what uh, we've said is that um, in the, the two degree scenario, I'll just I'll focus on that, um, is that if we want to meet these goals, uh, these are the, the the most cost effective steps that we can take to meet these goals. So um, you know often the question we get framed a little bit differently. You know what is the the possibility of, of meeting these these long term goals and and I would say, well, I don't know. It's 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 a, more of a choice than a than a possibility. So, um, the difference is, uh, I think, uh, there are a range of scenarios, and these are these are pathways uh, that we can take. And I'd say uh, a number of the the scenarios that that you described really have a different endpoint. Um, so, yeah, if if our endpoint is is different, yeah, we're going to have a different pathway. So. You know, uh, one of the things I want to just emphasize a little bit with our scenarios that I think are misunderstood, um, you know, we don't see a, an energy system that's 100% uh, renewables by 2050. Uh, we actually see uh, 
that fossil fuels contribute to 40 percent of the primary energy by 2050 under the two degree scenario. So that's down significantly. Today it's around 80 percent of uh, global primary energy. So it's a big shift, but we still see fossil fuels playing a, a significant role. Um, so th the last thing I'll say is that uh, all models are wrong, but some are useful. And uh, I really think uh, and hope that we fall into that, that uh, framework of being a, a useful analytical exercise, because what we have to do is take from this and say, uh, especially in our tracking port, uh, report, where are we? Uh, do we truly want to make this goal, and are we making meaningful progress in that direction? And, and, and the clear answer is no. And this has economic implications, climate uh, implications, and, and social implications, and, and energy security implications. So from that perspective, um, we, we really have to determine where we want to go and, and actually take uh, meaningful steps and get the leadership uh, to get there. And then, uh, Madame. Uh, Will Cole from Johns Hopkins University. <clears throat> Question about nuclear power, which could be uh, attractive from a sustainability perspective going forward. Uh, how, do, how do you see nuclear growing in a post-Fukushima world? And does the IEA have a position on nuclear power? taking the question, not because I'm French, but because it's, I think it's an important question. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, we see the, the role of nuclear as, a, as, 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 a, as important, as, uh, but we are technology neutral, and the idea is true for all our <laughs> work, and it's up to each country to decide on its an, a, electricity mix, and, 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 and it's certainly not, so we're not prescriptive at all in this, uh, in the, in the, in this book. Uh, we 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 take stock of the tracking uh, um, energy uh, clean energy progress report about recent development on nuclear and they are not very positive to 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 be to be to be frank because of the of the consequences of uh, Fukushima, also because uh, in the case of the U.S. for instance the the, the, the very very the the the, the very uh, um, uh, cheap prices of gas make nuclear less, less cost effective if you put aside the issues about uh, public acceptance or, or, or safety and, and and we saw I think last year four nuclear pl plants being being uh, stopped in the in the US because it was no more cost effective to invest in refurbishment and modernization of uh, of these plants so uh, there is an uh, the, uh, beyond the issue of public acceptance, the question of cost effectiveness of nuclear is posed in uh, in many uh, OECD uh, OECD countries. The positive side is what is happening in emerging economies, and most of the new build uh, is in emerging economies. So you have a massive opposition between the the stock of nuclear plant, which is 80 percent in OECD countries, and the and the number of new builds, and we saw a number of new uh, new start of new uh, new builds uh, in 2013, and and 80 percent of them are in emerging economies, and and a large chunk of it in in China. Uh, so we do think that uh, nuclear will play an imp will have uh, an important role to play. But we've um, taken into account these recent developments, and the contribution to the 2DS coming from nuclear is lower in ETP 2014 than it was in two than it was in 2000. Uh, um, in 2012, uh, and the role of renewables has been increased, so just reflecting what ha what's happening in, 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 in various countries. So in doing our assumption, we of course take into account policy decisions like the decision of Germany, uh, political uncertainty in, in countries like, like, like Japan or France, that are two countries for which nuclear is very important, but where the future role of nuclear is quite uncertain in, in, in both countries. Uh, or the uh, problem of competitiveness, like in the case of the of the U.S. But at global level, uh, the share of nuclear is, is in, in in the in, in the two DS is is, is uh, by mem memory around 17 percent. So it's it's quite it's still still significant because uh, uh, in all scenarios we have a, a progression of uh, of nuclear. I'll just add one uh, one point to that. One of the, the um, statistics I found interesting that came out of our analysis uh, when we look at our progress. So again, nuclear uh, was in the red category as we're not making enough progress. And by 2025, we see that 
um, we will be between 5 and 25 percent behind uh, 2DS targets. And so what that is, makes very clear to me is it's highly uncertain right now, the progress of, of nuclear. So um, we really uh, don't know what is going to happen from a policy and, and uh, deployment progress uh, over the next 10 years. So that's a concern. We've had some meetings here on the small scale nuclear. Is, uh, is that technology uh, factored into this, your outlook or do you, you think it's still too uncertain? I'd say broadly no. We, we definitely monitor it and um, we are uh, producing a, a technology roadmap on uh, um, nuclear power. So uh, from that perspective, uh, I think we'll, we'll take even a closer look at uh, what the role of a small scale nuclear. Thank you. Yes. Good morning, my name is Rosemary Seguero. I'm a USA based Kanban. I focus on African rural electrification. Uh, do you think uh, your technology could be used in Africa? I don't see Africa on your, as one of your members. Do you think Africa would be one of your members in this? And how would that your technology be used in Africa? You just talked about China. Looking at China now, China is going to Africa using the same renewables and from Africa and exporting and using. So how do you see this working in Africa, looking at your technology? Thank you. Let me start. And, um, I think in the, 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 the development of renewables and decentralized power system is, uh, is, is sometimes very relevant for developing countries, for Africa in particular with the capacity to do a lot of savings in terms of investment in the infrastructure and leapfrogging to more decentralized system. And uh, when I mentioned in, in like for storage, one of the, one of the most promising option is uh, developing uh, PV system with, uh, 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 with storage, with batteries for isolated regions where uh, it can be a very, very cost effective solution. Uh, and will be more the case even if we make, uh, uh, as we make progress in terms of the cost of uh, storage system and batteries. Um, so that, that and I think there are in, in important, important aspect in the, in the development of distributed power generation for developing countries. Um, David, if you have other ideas. Uh, just a small comment. Uh, we do work very closely with South Africa. Um, so, um, but, um, uh, and we are seeing, uh, obviously, significant developments uh, in that, that region, uh, some of it uh, around uh, coal technologies and, and some of it uh, around um, solar technologies uh, as examples. Um, so, yeah, again, the, the one area we do want to do more work um, and, and uh, is around uh, distributed power systems and, and um, uh, for rural electrification. So that is... Uh, something that we're, we're planning uh, to, to do, make more effort on, because uh, I think that's one of the, the key technologies uh, that are going to play a role in the long term, uh, leveraging smart grid technologies to really uh, do that in a, a fashion that can uh, be done first uh, at, at the very small scale and then uh, grown over time and eventually connected to uh, largely uh, interconnected systems. I remember South Africa was one of the more... Uh, active countries in uh, sub-Saharan Africa, even when I was there in the mid-90s. Are there any other uh, sub-Saharan African countries participating in CERT meetings or any other? I have, I'm no, not that much. No, okay. Well, if I can just mention it, we need to work more with African countries and, and, and the World Energy Outlook this year will have a key chapter on Africa. And so they're doing a lot of workshop and preparative meetings in various African countries. So it's a new development for the, for the IEA, which I think is positive, is reflecting, I mean, the key role that Africa will play in the coming decades, uh, considering the current increasing population and, and growth of their economies. And, and Africa has also a very important role to play in terms of fossil fuel uh, production. Uh, it's well known for oil, but the new discoveries in terms of gas in the eastern part of Africa are also quite quite significant. So it, that's, uh, that's going to be, I think, an in important chapter of the World Energy Outlook this year. Yes, sir. 
Yes, hi, Adrian Gillen with the American Chemical Society. Uh, I have a question actually about uh, your technology's use in the Caribbean region, uh, which has a sort of unique disadvantage given its geographic location, um, the relative size with a lot of the nations in that area. Um, what sort of technologies or what sort of advice would you give to this region um, if they would like to pursue uh, energy diversification and the like? I think, uh, I think largely you, you hit on it by just asking and using the word diversification. And um, I think focusing just on elect, uh, electricity systems, um, you know, when we talk to a number of countries in that there are a uh, broad range of issues, uh, whether it's a, you know, antiquated uh, infrastructure um, and electricity theft, I'll just touch on those. And that's where I think there can be some real uh, practical solutions around uh, smart grid technologies to um, reduce uh, electricity theft and, and uh, improve uh, system reliability and resilience because, of course, uh, weather is a key issue. But if you don't have a sustainable electricity system, you can't maintain it, uh, keep or, or uh, improve its reliability. And then from that perspective, people are more likely to steal it because it has less value. So, um, you know. And then by modernizing your electricity system, that does provide a pathway to deploy more renewables uh, into those systems. So, you know, I think diversification is the key. Um, you know, there are a number of, uh, you know, systems that are using primarily oil, and, and you know, oil is just so expensive, you know, to try to move away from that. Um, and as renewables have really come down in the last number of years, I think it is providing uh, more logical pathways uh, to move into solar technologies and wind technologies um, more cost effectively um, and uh, in a way to improve um, energy security uh, much better. So yeah, I think uh, you nailed it on the head by just asking about diversification. That's important. Yes, back row. Uh, James Sang, following up on the last question, um, as you project out to 2050 with your mix of um, sources for electricity, what kind of metrics do you use for reliability and resilience? And do you use the same metrics for all the different geographic areas? Uh, reliability and resilience don't really come into play because the analysis uh, works on both a uh, capacity uh, of installed technology, but also on energy uh, supply and demand perspective. So because it's done at a global level, it's, it's very difficult to go into the operational aspects at a global level. With that said, some of the work that we, we did this year on the storage technology has taken a very close look at um, uh, electricity load curves and how the systems are, are operated, and that's then fed back into our global models from a capacity and, and energy supply and demand perspective. So um, it is, we're increasingly going in that direction to include operational aspects, but really one of the things that, that links to another report out of the IEA is the integration of renewables. And we don't see uh, on a global level that being a threat at this stage. The, the, in a, the, the levels that we see in the two degree scenario are um, able to be integrated in a reliable fashion um, and it's, it's some countries, uh, Europe being one, or regions I should say, Europe being one of them actually has very high shares of uh, variable renewables going out to 2050, yet they are making the steps now about integrated markets uh, as well as uh, large shares of um, uh, hydro, pumped hydro in, in the north and, and strong interconnection throughout Europe that I think is, is going to allow them to really get to those high shares uh, in a reliable fashion. Uh, Bob, Bob Hershey. Hi, I'm Bob Hershey, I'm a consultant. Uh, to what extent does cost come into this for the various things you looked at? Well, if we reflect on the, the one curve when we, we look at um, that, that Didier showed about the, the cost effectiveness of the energy transition, what we do see is that regardless of scenarios, we see tremendous investments needed in the global, um, in global energy systems. 
but it is indeed going to cost about 44 trillion more by 2050 uh, to um, transition from a, a current trend to a two degree scenario. So, but the energy savings in that perspective uh, it come up to around 115 trillion dollars. So even even with a 10 percent discount rate, we see that as being cost effective. So. You know, it's it's. I what I find interesting is that um, an additional report from the the IEA on finance, which uh, reflected that uh, a very significant portion of investment in the global energy system is going to replace existing infrastructure or uh, into uh, supply investment to replace existing capacities for fossil fuels and and whatnot. So from that perspective. Significant investments are needed, so now what, where do we put them? We, we actually now have a choice, and I think that is one of the very important messages here is that we have to spend the money anyway. Why don't we do it in a way that's sustainable, that, that gives us these uh, you know, air quality benefits, these climate benefits, uh, these economic benefits, but you know, changing the tide a bit is, uh, is a difficult process, so we're trying to create the arguments that really uh, push people in, in what we think is a better direction. I just would like to add one thing on this is that the, in, the, in, the, in this 44 trillion US dollar additional investment and, uh, and, and, and as David pointed out in all scenarios you have an enormous increase, I mean needs for investment, a large chunk of it is linked to transport uh, rather than just electricity and, and why? Because since the previous EDPs, what we see, and it's another global issue, is the need, the demand for mobility is increasing at extremely rapid rates in emerging economies. So one of the key challenges is what sort of, what transport system they're going to put in place. And if they follow, let's say, the Northern American model, uh, we cannot move to a sustainable uh, uh, energy system. That's absolutely clear. So in these additional costs, the transition to a um, transport system which is sustainable, including uh, e-mobility, but also much, uh, much more uh, public transport system, uh, electrifying some, some of the freight transport, <coughs> uh, having much more stringent fuel economy standards, having more uh, 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 energy efficient cars. It's a number of things that need to be done all in combination if you want to meet this increase demand for transport in a sustainable manner. This is, this is one of the most uh, costly and difficult issues. It's not necessarily the, the power generations. There are issues for the transition, but the additional costs are not that big. If that's the, yeah, I'd just like to make another point, if I may, about the uh, scenarios. We have a number of questions about the scenarios, but what you find in ETP is not just an analysis of scenario. By far, you have a lot of other things. I think all the electricity sub chapter, the, some of the points are, Underline, underlined by, um, uh, by the uh, 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 scenario analysis, but you have a, uh, a lots of analysis of current status of various technologies, what are the key issues, some policy recommendations. It's not just about scenarios, and what we've tried to do is to be quite synthetic in terms of the scenario results and put many of the data on the web. That's the meaning of the last slide that a lot of the data and, 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 and scenario results are available from the website and you just have the key results in the book itself because I think people are more interested in looking at what are the policy questions, what is the status of current technologies, where are the key issues, and, and that's we've been, that, that we've tried to do is focus more on this than on the uh, scenario numbers. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Didier. Is there one last question, anyone? Uh just to follow up on the point you just made about the, uh, the before the data was, uh, you know, it's the key is spending money. And I think, you know, example is we spent a lot of money to get a lead platinum rating on this building. And the building sector remains one that still has a huge potential based on, on your chart there for technological improvement. <laughs> and it's, whereas you take an industry like Adrian's representing chemicals, they've you know, they've done a pretty good job of capturing a lot of that through the latest technology because the incentive, it's a much stronger incentive at the bottom line when you're running a chemical company than, you know, building a building, whereas you're maybe trying to cut costs. So anyway, it's just, uh, so th with that, let me uh, once again thank uh, Didier and David for uh, excellent presentation and thank you.
thank thank you all for coming thanks thank you thank you